No. Why would you think that? You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you so much to those of you who listen to the Locked On Vikings podcast every single day. My frequent question askers for days like today, Twitter Tuesdays. Love you all. Love chatting with you guys each and every day. So thank you so much for coming out. If you are new here, hello and welcome. You picked a perfectly weird day to start. <laughs> you can find the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts, whether it is an audio listening app like Sirius XM or on Amazon Fire and Roku if you download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app or just go to YouTube. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for 20 bucks off your first purchase. And it is, of course, Twitter Tuesday. If you have questions for me, you can get them to me anytime at Luke Braun NFL or at Locked On Vikings on Twitter. You can also send that, me an email at LockedOnVikingsPodcast at gmail.com or fill out the Google form in the show notes. Those latter two are going to be a better way to get it in the show, but sometimes I just answer you directly. So just give me a question, however. Let's get into the questions that you all submitted. And the first one comes from the lengthy question asker, who says, A trade my brother and I came up with is Herbert from the Chargers, as they are already in a rebuild and every position is terrible for a few firsts. It gives them ammunition for a rebuild and allows Harbaugh to get his guy. Why isn't this an idea I've seen anywhere else? So I'm surprised you haven't seen that because there was like a whole day where the conversation was, I, I think it was Score North had it on, they, they do like a reckless speculation where they they posit ideas like this. Um, and it like generated genuine discourse, which is very funny because that's not an idea that should be genuinely discoursed. Both because, look, when you have like the franchise quarterback, you don't just like give him up for draft picks. That's not a thing that teams like ever do. Uh, unless there's like a full on like Deshaun Watson style falling out. <laughs> and I don't think that's happening in LA. Uh but also salary cap wise, it's like basically impossible for uh, the Chargers to successfully trade Justin Herbert. So if the Chargers tried to trade Justin Herbert, uh, the league would say no, like they wouldn't be able to process the trade because it would put them over the cap by like $15 million. So they'd have to like cut other players to make it work. Like it's so deeply infeasible. Uh, and I think we like heavily overrate the, this guy coached a quarterback in college thing. It's not like teams aren't going to move heaven and earth to make that happen just because he's the guy. And, and I think, I don't know if it were me, I would much rather have Justin Herbert than JJ McCarthy. I don't think a lot of people would super disagree with that. So I, there's like a million reasons not to see that happen. Uh, it's just not possible for the chargers. Uh, moving on to the next one, Jish fish asks, of the QB prospects, who do you think has the most fixable flaw if they get the proper coaching? This is a kind of tough one uh, because I'm not a QB coach, so I don't know how easy certain stuff is to fix. <laughs> and that's part of the difficulty in, in like QB evaluation is you do kind of have to make a guess at that because the guy that does have an issue but gets that issue fixed or at least mitigated turns into Josh Allen, and the guy who doesn't get that issue fi fixed turns into Sam Darnold, right? Uh, who's now on his third team, uh, fourth team in like three years. <laughs> uh, so I guess to me, it's JJ McCarthy because I think his issue is, I think the issue is, is a mechanical one. And if you, uh, get rid of the mechanical issue, then he can throw with more confidence and that can help everything. So I guess I would go with JJ McCarthy, but also, the the pot of gold at the end of that rainbow isn't as as spicy as the issue of like fixing Drake May's pocket thing. Honestly, Drake May's issue is also not entirely unfixable, but depends on who his QB coach is, right? Or if his QB coach has a different issue that he wants to fix instead that I'm not even seeing. Like, it's so hard to answer that question, but I, I don't know. I guess, yeah, JJ, I suppose, but I don't feel very confident. Oregon Mac asks, have you watched the 2022 Holiday Bowl, May versus Knicks? They both played very well in the game. 
Both teams play a lot of quick game, which many use to downplay Nix's skills, but you recently said that use that to play up May's skills, and Nix being a system guy sort of ignores that McCarthy is the same. Why are these other two dudes so much higher on the boards? Okay, so what you're going to find about me with Bo Nix is I might be the only guy that doesn't care that they ran a lot of quick game. Um, and, and it was kind of the same thing with Levis last year, which which was a similar situation, super different quarterback, but at least a similar like, whoa, their offense is a bunch of short game kind of deal. I love seeing that. I love seeing that you can get the ball out in rhythm. And if Bo Nix is on my team, I am running the most West Coast like Mickey Mouse offense ever because he can get the ball out quickly. I'll never have pressure to worry about it all. If I have Bo Nix and a crappy O-line, like there is a vision to the offense I can I can construct. And so I'll take that, right? Um, for me, the issues with Bo Nix are numerous other things that I went over in a, in a podcast about him and you can find at, at patreon.com slash Luke Brown NFL. I won't go crazy about that. But I so, I, so I guess I agree with what you're getting at here that I don't think that running a lot of quick game is necessarily a bad thing because quick game will happen in the NFL too. And I'm glad that we get to evaluate how you do in it. Uh, you know, it's, it makes it a more difficult evaluation for Bo Nix because there's limited sample of like other stuff to look at, but I, I don't know. I felt like I got enough and I could get a sense for who he was. So didn't worry me there. Uh, the major issue that I had with Bo Nix was that I think he throws the ball a certain way because of a lack of arm strength. Uh, and that's just not an issue that I see with Drake may and JJ McCarthy. I think uh, to put it a, a, a more like, uh, results focused way. There's a more explosive potential. I don't think you get explosive plays with Bo Nix. You can get explosive plays with McCarthy and definitely with Drake May and ultimately explosive plays win games. Jake Nelson asks, how many times when scouting this year's QBs did you see them running staple Vikings concepts like flag, bow, crash, wave? Oh, love it. You've been listening. Uh, how, if at all, did that impact your opinion on them? So the exact concepts I didn't see, I mean, every offense has like their version of a wrap, which is what Bo is. It's just an arrow route or like a little curl and then, uh, an, an in route, a dig basic, whatever you want to call it, um, kind of crossing behind it. Everybody's got a wrap concept or whatever. Um, but what really I'm looking for too, is just the throws. Like I know there's a lot of corner routes because flag, the, the flag route in the McVeigh terminology is a corner route. Um, so how do you throw a corner route? Like that's a, that's a thing, right? Um, so you can still kind of proxy, see the throws that you're making, but the actual reads, I'm just looking for, can you execute timing generally? Like, can you execute in, in a rhythm, uh, in a, in a fairly consistent rhythm, not in the particular rhythm that O'Connell uses, of course, it's going to be a different rhythm. You have to learn that's going to be part of the rookie growing pains. And, you know, we, we can all just be aware of that then that sort of applies to everybody. Um, but I'm looking more for kind of the components of that offense rather than saying, do they run these concepts exactly? The only quarterback I, I remember looking at that I was like, oh, this is just the McVay offense was when I watched Jaron Hall at BYU. Uh, and that was part of why I liked him as a day three guy because it's like, all right, well, you know, the learning curve is going to be that much shorter. Maybe he can get in a little quicker if, if he indeed is needed to be called upon. Adam asks, considering the fact that the last few years basically proves that selecting a QB is a crapshoot and nobody knows anything for certain when it comes to evaluating QBs, shouldn't the best way to approach this draft for the Vikings be to draft the best available QB at 11, like McCarthy or Penix, and then again at 23, i.e. Knicks or Penix? Okay, love the thinking outside the box here. Love where your head's at. Um, here's why your idea is bad. <laughs> I'm sorry here, but here's, here's the issue. Uh, basically after like pick 10, your chances of finding a good quarterback, just like plummet. Uh, if, if that quarterback is worth a damn, he's getting picked in the top five, maybe seven, eight picks. Right. And, and the guys like Mahomes and, and Allen that go outside of the top five, are clearly like represent a really big risk. And they're these like super hyper, you know, raw, but athletic prospects. And as many of them work out as don't. So it's like, you know, the, the risky, maybe this could be the guy type. Um, it, like maybe that's where JJ McCarthy should go like seventh or eighth. Right. Cause that's just the way that quarterback is treated, even though, you know, you would never think about that for any other position. So there's a guy, Skull Analytics. I'll, uh, he's got a WordPress. I'll link the piece. He just did uh, not that long ago, posted a piece 
like essentially trying to measure the value of trading up against like draft charts and historical QB cumulative approximate value, which is like a similar wins above replacement stat and wins above replacement themselves. Um, the, the PFF version of it. And he essentially, you, you can like see this like huge steep drop off that levels out around pick 11. And at that point you, it's truly dart throws. Sometimes you get a Russell Wilson in the third round, but it happens pretty rarely. So I think the reason not to do that is by the time you're picking Penix or Knicks, the, the odds that that guy turns into the guy is low enough that are low enough where it is no longer preferable to taking a guy you're a lot more certain about at another position who's who's got that first round pedigree. I guess that would be the reason to do it. It's you're taking two really, you know, buying two lottery tickets or putting one chip on a on a coin flip, you know, in in roulette, like a one chip on black and roulette. The roulette is going to be better odds than your lottery tickets. Today's episode of Locked on Vikings is brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is online therapy made easy and designed to fit your schedule. It is convenient, flexible, and uh, suited to your needs and what you actually need from therapy. Look, I, I'm a huge proponent of getting into therapy. I think it is for everyone. Uh, whether you feel like you need it or not, maintenance is still good, and I think it's it's good to stay on top of your mental health like that. But getting into therapy has two big barriers, at least. One is you might find a therapist that just isn't good, that just stinks. And BetterHelp can, if you if you don't like the therapist, you can switch at no additional charge. It's one of the things that BetterHelp offers. And the other thing is that it's just difficult to find, like to carve out a time every single week or every other week uh, to, to really commit to that. And that's why being able to do this on a video call or even just via like text or phone, whatever you're comfortable with can help kind of break down those barriers and get you taken care of yourself in a way that you probably should. Find your social sweet spot with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on. Thanks a bunch for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day. When you're done here, go over to the Locked On Minnesota Sports YouTube page. You can get their 24-7 live stream. A lot of Timberwolves talk going on right now. A uh, little bit of wild talk. The twins are now going. And, of course, this show uh, and all of the LO Minnesota Sports uh, roundtables and p- parties and stuff, all there 24-7 blasting your earballs with all things Minnesota sports. Let's move on. With this Twitter Tuesday episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast, next one comes from Casey the Coolis, who asks, what are we doing at left guard? Is Brandell the guy, or are we waiting till after the draft to sign Reisner? Boy, I do hope that they bring someone else in. I, I would say waiting till after the draft is where we're at. I don't think they're like actively negotiating with any free agents or anything like that. We're way too close to the draft for that. So it'll be after the draft or during the draft this gets addressed. So maybe you have a fourth round pick that comes in and you say, okay, Brandell, Feeney, and a rookie all compete. And, you know, we'll see who comes out of that competition. And maybe they're happy with that. I would not feel great about that. Uh, and, you know, it just, just hope somebody has a great camp. Or they will sign a guy like Reisner after the draft. I do, I'm pretty sure that Reisner's market has kind of determined that it is going to wait till after the draft, uh, probably for comp pick reasons, which would give the Vikings kind of a, a, an, um, an advantage because it doesn't affect their comp pick one, one way or another. But I guess maybe they also want Reisner to give Reisner every single second he possibly could to go out and um, give a comp pick back to the Vikings. Uh, that brings me to Mason Edwards's question who asks, how did the Shaq Griffin signing impact the comp pick formula? Did go over this in more detail and the comp pick formula, like how it works and stuff in a, in an episode when Shaq Griffin got signed, I think it was that episode. Uh, but real quick, the broad strokes is Shaq Griffin counts for a sixth round pick in the compensatory formula. Which means because the the Vikings signed a guy that counts toward the compensatory formula, that will cancel out one of theirs. And like cancels like the bet the closest that you can find, because without Shaq Griffin, the only two picks that the Vikings were supposed to be getting were two third round picks. He just cancels out the lower the closest of those two, so the lower of those two picks. So if they hadn't signed him, they would have had two third round picks. But in reality he's canceling out like another sixth for somebody like, I don't know, like KJ Osborne or whatever. Um, it just, 
the the way it worked out, like timing wise, he, yeah, if they did not sign him, they would have kept a third round compensatory pick for the 2025 draft. It's going to be May asks, how does it work out if you trade a player that's still under contract? Generally, who pays what? Um, super generally, the the player that or the team that gets the player is paying out that contract. So if you think about like Stefan Diggs, most of his contract is paid out by the Texans, and then they reworked that and changed stuff about that contract. But most of that contract is paid out by the Texans. The only cap that stays with the original team, um, or the only money that stays with the original team is the cap hits for money that has already been paid out to that player. So a signing bonus. Signing bonuses get paid out at the, sign at the outset of the contract, but their cap hits get spread out over years. Those have to stay with the original team. The Bills paid Stefan Diggs that money. They need to account for it on their salary cap. And I believe, it, it, it check me on this, but I believe it works the same with like not likely to be earned incentives. If I give a player an incentive, you're going to get 10 sacks, and they've never gotten 10 sacks. So the salary cap sees that as unlikely to be earned. Uh, and therefore, it doesn't count against my salary cap that that incentive money um, for that year. I just I don't have to pay that incentive money because the cap doesn't think he's going to get it. But if he does get it, then I just pay it the next year. He gets paid out the second he hits. He gets that 10th tenth sack. He gets paid out for that game. But then I have to account for it on my cap the next year. And I think if I trade that player away, I still have to account for that on that next year's cap. It's like a cap penalty, I guess you could call it. Um, and then that would be dead cap. That's generally how trading, uh, contracts works. Everything else, bonuses or roster bonuses, uh, likely to be earned earn set or like future incentives, all kinds of salary, all that stuff all stays or all goes travels with the player to the new team. Aiden L asks, regardless of who we pick in the first round, QB, your defensive player, et cetera, and Penix or Bo Nix fell to the third round. What are your thoughts on trading to get them that late? Is it a bad idea to have two rookie QBs and a higher percentage of one of them becoming our franchise QB? So this is kind of like that earlier question uh, where like, look, if he's falling to, if you're getting a quarterback in the third round, you basically, you can expect them to be a backup quarterback because of how the value of quarterback just warps. Teams are, if they really believe in that guy, they are getting a starter. So they're, they're going to trade up if they think they're getting a starter, right? Like they're going to do this early in the first round as early as they can. So if teams are all passing on him, that kind of already means that the team that drafted him sees him as a backup QB and the Vikings don't need a backup QB. They have Sam Darnold for that or the bridge QB. They have Sam Darnold for that. So they don't really need to do that. That said, um, the, like if Penix or Knicks fell to the third round, I do like that's probably value at that point, right? So whoever does get those quarterbacks there, you can say, wow, they really got a great value on their QB. I'm going to guess that if it Kellen Mons out, you're not really going to care that you only spend a third rounder on that guy. But hey, for whatever it's worth, you saved a penny. Uh, Wolves back asks, once Kirk got hurt, Bradbury started calling protections at the line of scrimmage. Did you notice anything different in how the O-line played when that happened? Not really. So the way I understand it, and this is an understanding from 2021, so it's been a while, and, and if things changed, I apologize. Um, but but Kirk Cousins was asked about this in a in a talk he gave in the in the 2021 offseason. And he said that Bradbury always is the one setting the protections. And that Cousins has like veto power. He can go adjust it and he can he can make depending on what he sees. Um, but it's always gonna be Bradbury. So I don't think a lot of that changed. And actually, I think with Mullins and Hall, not necessarily Dobbs, things were different there. Um, but with Mullins and Hall, those guys still had the same veto power. And it's just a matter of which guy used it more. So I don't think a lot changed there, but good looking out. Um, Shadow Flame asked, with the new special teams rules, what do you think we'll do regarding our special teams unit for next year? Do you expect any new additions to any of those positions do during camp? Um, I actually talked about this a little bit when it first came out, but... Um, Again, like to really quick recap. So the new format, I think, is going to prioritize size over speed a little bit more than it did before. So whereas you used to maybe keep seven cornerbacks because one of them is a special teams ace, maybe you now keep 11 offensive linemen or even 12 offensive linemen and not quite as many defensive backs. And I think the same goes for like linebackers and tight ends, which are pretty universal. But I actually think extra tight ends will have like additional utility in this format in particular. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a, a tight end heavy world. 
Cam Ekstorm says Diggs has only had defensive first old school football coaches like Zim and McDermott. Do you think we, he would have been more content on, under KOC? Okay, so this is no longer a Vikings question. Been a while since Diggs was a Viking. But my understanding of Stefan Diggs from both his time in Minnesota and in Buffalo is that offensive or defensive minded or whatever is not his issue. Might have been your issue, but it's not his issue. His issue is winning. If you had a game where you ran every single play and you won 13 to 10 and he didn't get a cat, get, get a catch at all, he probably would be okay with that. And there were games in Minnesota, at least where he like totally disappeared, but the Vikings won because he was getting doubled or whatever. And he was asked about, it and he's like, nah, we take these like, this is fine. I am fine with this. Uh, his frustration, some of it might be interpersonal, right? It might just be like not liking a specific guy, but um, his frustration is when you, if you lose and you didn't target digs, he's going to have a fairly valid point. Hey, we might've won if you threw it to me more. What the heck? But I can't remember a time where he said that and wasn't like very right, which was always made it really hard for me to see him as like this villain. You know, it's, he's like, he's got a point. <laughs> uh, I've got a, the weirdest Third segment of questions. I'm so excited. You guys went deep in your bags. I love it. Let's get to it soon. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by Game Time, which is the best place to find last minute tickets to anything going on. Look, NBA playoffs are coming soon. If you want to get to a Wolves game, check it out on Game Time. You can get, there are so many ways to save money, whether it is just the last minute deals, you can save up to 60% from buying last minute for sports and even like comedy theater, whatever. But by that point, or maybe even an hour up into the event, people are just trying to get rid of their tickets. You might be able to find a really good deal there. Plus, uh, you can toggle on all in pricing, which means you see your checkout total up front, no hidden fees, no nothing else. They are very upfront and honest with you. You can see your seat view, and all of that. So take all the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNFL for 20 bucks off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-F-L for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Moving on to the weird part of this Twitter Tuesday episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast. We're already asking Diggs questions. We've gotten way off the rails here. Let's go further. We've got a couple of interesting hypotheticals here from Nate Walton, and I'm going to do both of them. First one is, uh, you need a QB to win in a pro-style offense against the 2020 Vikings defense, and you have to watch the game to save them. So I am assuming you're talking late stages 2020 defense, because the early 2020 defense was like a complete thought. Late stage, we had Cordrea Tankersley's and Todd Davis's. We had like street free agents at like five positions. I'm assuming you're talking about the six touchdown Alvin Kamara defense. Uh, and the choices at quarterback are Hendon Hooker, Kellen Mond, or Joe Milton. <laughs> I uh, Who do you choose? Okay, so my war against the Tennessee Volunteers is on an indefinite pause because Tennessee got to the final four of the NCAA bracket and helped me get fifth place in the locked on pool. So top five finish large in large part, thanks to the Tennessee volunteers. We're okay for now. So my, uh, otherwise I would have just defaulted to Kellen Mond because he wasn't a Tennessee volunteer. Um, so I haven't watched a snap of Joe Milton, so I can't really, all I know is he throws the ball far and I've seen like two reps from him at his pro day and they looked really bad. So I'm going to, take him out of this because all I've seen is not great stuff. Uh, Kellen Mond, probably, I think it's Hooker, to be honest with you. I, I think it's Hendon Hooker um, because at, at least he operated quickly. Uh, and I don't know if you can say the same thing. I, you, I d definitely don't think you can say the same thing about Kellen Mond. And I'm not sure Joe Milton doesn't seem like the kind of guy that does that. But Hendon Hooker could like get the ball out in reasonable. He, he wasn't late off. It was an accuracy thing. That was my deal with him. The other one from Nate Walton is that our rookie QB, whoever, does not beat out Sam Darnold in 2024. Darnold magically leads the Vikings to the familiar NFC championship lost by a random starter. <laughs> what do you do next year? Okay, so I hate to be boring, but the answer is it depends. And it, it super depends on exactly how much we feel like Sam Darnold drove that uh, that 
that win, right? It was really easy to move on from Keenum, even after that NFC Championship game, because we all kind of understood that this was not going to keep happening. But if we want to go to like the the full on maximum perfect Sam Darnold outcome is the one where the problem was just the Jets and the Panthers. And then he actually looked okay with the 49ers and he's actually a decent quarterback. And it was all just Jets incompetence. Like there is this like weird corner case where I guess that's the outcome. And if we're making the playoffs and like winning playoff games, that might be the case. Um, it would be unendingly funny to see Sam Darnold start one year with the Vikings and already eclipse Kirk Cousins in terms of playoffs wins. That would be hilarious. Certain people would never live that down. Um, <laughs> that would be my first take is some some people have to answer for their crimes but uh the i i think it but it really it really really depends right if we're going well this guy was clearly just hucking him up to justin jefferson all year jj got two thousand yards and it was clearly the jefferson season and just like a rando and and maybe the rookie's better next year or something like that like it becomes easier to move on um and especially if it's somebody that we feel you know needs a whole year and they're just like incubating not that they're like bad Like, there is a world where the QB sits his entire rookie year and then is good. Like, that can happen. So, patience with that. Um, Yeah, it would be easy to move on unless we really feel like Sam Darnold just unlocked really, really good play and it's more like a Geno Smith situation where we go, hey, wait, maybe this is the guy. Uh, Purple and Gold Hero asks, what draft pick breaks the curse? Now, so I clarified that he said this could be any curse. So, I pick the alt uniforms curse. Uh, which can't be fixed by a draft pick, of course. Um, But that would be, let's say it's the rookie quarterback, whoever it is, winning for the first time in the throwbacks. So if you're unfamiliar, the Vikings have had a horrible history with all uniforms, in particular their opponents wearing all uniforms. The Alvin Kamara aforementioned six touchdown game, all uniforms. They were in their color rush for that game. Uh, The Bears have terrorized the Vikings with various alternate uniforms. Um, speaking of Stefan Diggs, the, the truth to all rumors game, that was an alt uniform game. Um, you know, the soldier field curse kind of overlaps with that. Uh, the Scott Tolzien tie, the Vikings were in what I will call an alt uniform, which was their home uniform in a, uh, with the purple pants. And it was the first time they ever wore that. Uh, there are a lot of bad experiences with alt uniforms with the Vikings. And now in their throwbacks, they're Owen two. So the draft pick quarterback comes in debut game. Vikings wear their throwbacks. He's electric. They win the game. That breaks the curse, I think. Uh, Zin Diesel asks, which QB from this class draft class would lead the Spartans into the Battle of Thermopylae? <laughs> this is, I think, of all the questions I've ever gotten on Twitter Tuesday, the one that balances absurdity with a clear answer more than any I've like, how is this this weird of a question? And also so obviously Drake may like it's so clearly Drake may would do this. And that's purely a vibes thing. But I don't feel I need to explain myself because doesn't that instantly make sense? It's of course Drake may. Uh, anonymous anteater, by the way, the, the next two questions are bears questions for some reason. Uh, I'll answer them, but just, you know, as a heads up to viewer discretion is advised. Um, anonymous anteater asks, has Ryan Poles set up the Bears for a better future than the Vikings? And knowing what you know now about Quasi and Poles, uh, about how they've approached the rebuilds, did the Vikings make a mistake letting the Bears interview and hire Poles first? So this is another one that I've pared down. It was a very long thing about how the Bears are in a better position, but I don't super agree that Ryan Poles has set the Bears up at, in a better com- uh, position to get a QB. Because here's the deal. Both the Bears and the Vikings will say pissed away seasons on quarterbacks that weren't their future quarterback right? The Vikings, it was Kirk Cousins. With the Bears, it was Justin Fields. Ryan Poles ate two Justin Fields seasons instead of moving on from him. And now he's moved on from him. The Vikings did the same thing. So you call both those seasons, you know, wasted time. The Vikings won more games and now have a more well-constructed roster. Uh, Here's the, if you look at like environments for QBs, the the Vikings have Justin Jefferson. Nobody on the Bears touches that, right? Yeah, they've got Keenan Allen and DJ Moore. The Vikings have Jefferson, Addison, and hopefully at some point in the season, Hawkinson. Um, I'll take Hawkinson over Komet. I'll take our wide receiver duo over their wide receiver duo, and I'm absolutely taking our tackles over their tackles. Uh, and I'll take our play caller over their play caller. So I'm not really sure what part of the Bears is like better set up than the Vikings to nurture a quarterback. And I think part of that is because the Vikings didn't feel the need to get bad before they got good. 
uh, yeah, the the Bears are going to have a higher pick to get their quarterback, and we'll see if Caleb Williams is indeed the chosen one we all said. But he's going to be starting behind Darnell Wright, who is already starting to fall out of favor, and another rookie tackle, assuming that rookie tackle works out better than Darnell Wright, which, by definition, we can't really. Uh, and I, it's just not going to be as explosive of a team and a defensive head coach where the Vikings have this like QB guru, like this QB guy, right? So they very much focus better on the QB thing. And they dedicated themselves to a couple of years of Kirk Cousins. Let's get, let's make a run at this where the Bears dedicated themselves to spinning their tires and being really stingy about having the most cap space, which kind of runs counter to the whole idea. I don't think they did. I think they just have a lot of cap space and you feel like they have a really great roster, but what'd they do with it? Tremaine Edmonds? Uh, Peter asks, help! My brother has been brainwashed by the deep state uh, and it, of Ohio. <laughs> yes, Ohio. Okay, if there ever was a deep state, that state would be Ohio. Everybody agrees with that. Uh, into believing the Bears are making a mistake by moving on from Fields and would have been better off surrounding him with talent by trading the first overall pick again. I know this has nothing to do with the Vikings, but he listens to Lockdown Vikings and he won't listen to me. We need an intervention. P.S. His name is John. Okay, John. John, you're kind of cooking. I'm not going to lie. I'm sorry, Peter. I don't know if I'm, I'm on your side on this one. <laughs> Because I, it's it's because of the kinds of QB that that is. Like if Justin Fields is not your style of QB, if you just you're like you know what Justin Fields, we can't do this QB that you know is is overly reliant on his legs and you know always is thinking about making the crazy scramble play instead of just taking what's easy and in front of him and all these problems that got Justin Fields dealt and not for much. You know, super super lowly valued by the league. A lot of those traits apply to Caleb Williams as well. And you just hope that this time they develop it better. Um, but it can't be that we don't like the Justin Fields style of QB. It's like we just want to start over with another try at this. Uh, and if you're going to just try to like develop a QB, why not have it be the guy that doesn't cost you any more than you've already spent on him? It's obvious that you think a QB with these traits can be the guy so go with the guy that's in the building that has already, you know, been the leader here and, and stick with him a little bit. It does kind of feel like you took two steps and said, ah, let's let's do a reset. Um, and that doesn't make a lot of progress. So I super get it. <laughs> like, I get where John's coming from. I'm sorry, Peter. Um, and, you know, being able to amass a lot of picks and like actually try to build a team for once. That's great. The, the counter here is that Caleb Williams is just too good to, for that logic to apply to, which I also don't really see that. Um, I, not that I don't see him as a, as a top three player in, and don't understand why he's going first overall, but this like second, I don't, I wouldn't take him over Trevor Lawrence as a prospect or any of these other guys that have been touted as like the greatest prize. He's, he's just the number one guy this year. Uh, and I don't even have him as the number one guy this year. So take that for whatever you will. All right. Uh, we have already left the state of Minnesota, and now we're going to leave this podcast. So thanks for hanging out. I'll see you all tomorrow, probably with D-line stuff. So get excited for that. And as always, Skull.